Thank you so much, Carolyn, for helping us to understand the very practical ways that harm reduction strategies and treatment court best practices are aligned. And all of you should know that NADCP will have much more guidance for you on this topic as we move forward. Today we have the opportunity to talk in more detail about harm reduction and treatment courts and other high risk, high need populations. Let me begin by introducing you to our two panelists. Judge Tina Netto was appointed Associate Justice to the New Hampshire Superior Court in 1996. And in 2011, she was appointed Chief Justice of the Superior Court. In 2006, Judge Netto spearheaded the effort to open a drug court in Rockingham County and presided as the drug court judge. At that time, there were three operating drug courts in New Hampshire. Judge Netto has helped expand the number of drug courts in the state and is working to ensure New Hampshire's treatment courts are complying with national adult drug court best practice standards. And as of yesterday, Judge Netto is a member of the NADCP board. That's good. Angela Mallet is outreach director for the nonprofit End It For Good and is the founder of the Mississippi Harm Reduction Initiative. Angela serves as a state leader uh, for the, as state leader for the National Recovery Advocacy Project and acts as a liaison to recovery community organizations statewide. She was also named a champion in recovery for the state of Mississippi in 2018. Angela, yeah, Angela is a graduate of the 20th Judicial District Drug Court in Mississippi and is a person in long-term recovery. Please join me, yeah. Please join me in welcoming Judge Tina Netto and Angela Mallet. Thanks. Right here. Have a seat. All right. Well, let's get to work. I see that timer there. Okay. All right. Let's get to work. Uh, listen, I'm so glad to see so many of you here for this really important discussion. Uh, we have uh, been talking for a long time about the need to have a honest conversation with treatment court practitioners about this really important topic. And, and I want to begin with just a moment talking about abstinence. I want to go right there first, abstinence. Now, for many important reasons, people who are appropriately placed, placed in a treatment court, their goal is abstinence. That's their ultimate goal. Most of us here understand that treatment courts are for individuals who are not using because it's fun. They're, they're using when it's not fun. They're not using because they want to. They're using even when they desperately do not want to. They've crossed that line that happens where now you're using not to feel good, you're using to feel normal, to survive. And, but there's lots of people like that. But the, the treatment court population is for that individual who in addition to living with severe, moderate to severe substance use disorder, living with addiction, they are also have been determined in valid ways to be high risk, both by testing but through, through, through valid testing as well as what they have indicated that their reason for being involved in the justice system or in the family treatment court system is because of their substance use. That's why they're there. And so necessarily for this population, abstinence is the eventual goal. Now, Carolyn made it clear that abstinence and recovery can very much include from start to end, medications for addiction treatment. That's not the opposite of abstinence space. But that's the ultimate goal. So let's lean in there. And I want to start with you, Angela. As a, you know, you, you, your, you can be, your perspective is especially valuable to us as someone who is both an advocate for harm reduction and, and a person whose recovery began or was initiated in a treatment court. At least from my understanding, a lot of harm reduction is focused on safer use, using more safely. 
But I'm wondering, from your perspective, does abstinence have a role in any, does abstinence have any role in harm reduction approaches? Yeah, absolutely it does. You know, harm reduction is a pathway to recovery and harm reduction includes helping people get to the ultimate goal of abstinence-based recovery if that's where they need to, to land. Um, the term harm reduction, it, it's often associated with safe drug use and right. delivery of safe drug use supplies. But what I've learned over the past few years of really digging in and trying to understand what does harm reduction mean? How do we apply that to people who are using drugs? I understood that you know, harm reduction is really much broader than that. Harm reduction is it's meeting people where they are and saying, okay, you're here and this is causing some harms, it's causing problems in your life. How do we help you make better decisions to, so that you're not endangering yourself or the community? And let's take small baby steps to get you to this ultimate place of abstinence. Because today, you know, with overdoses so rampant, we have to start thinking outside of the box. Mm. Like how do we keep people alive long enough for them to get to this ultimate goal of abstinence? So people who assume that, yeah, that's worth you like that. You, yeah, you can acknowledge that. That's good. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. So people who like assume that harm reduction automatically excludes people whose ultimate goal in abstinence, that's not true, right? No, yeah. it's not. So uh, there, there are new meetings out there now called Harm Reduction Works Meetings. Harm, say that again? Harm Reduction Works Meetings. Works, okay. And they, they are kind of similar to 12-step meetings. They're one hour. You go in, you have readings at the beginning, and, and then you have open chair. And at the beginning of these Harm Reduction Works Meetings, we discuss if you are in abstinence-based recovery, you are welcome here. If you're interested, if you're still using and you're trying to get to a place of safer use and reduce the harms in your life, you're, you're welcome, welcome here. here. Yeah. If you are totally abstinent, you're welcome here. And I just love that because it's a space where everyone can come and you can be honest about where you are right now with your relationship with substances without fear of judgment. So Angela, I asked you whether or not abstinence has any role in harm reduction. Later on, not yet, later on, Judge, I'm gonna ask you whether or not safer use has any role in an absence space program, but we'll say that for later. Uh, but for now, for now, specifically, Judge, can, how can treatment courts practice harm reduction and other client-centered approaches while maintaining an abstinence-based recovery as the ultimate goal? Well, I mean, I, I think about harm reduction, and I know when people hear that term, they, something pops up in their mind, but harm reduction is really not all or nothing. And, and when we use a client-centered approach like harm reduction in treatment courts, then we are, we are building toward that ultimate goal of abstinence while at the same time using harm reduction techniques along the way to, to make sure we get there. And you know, we all know, for the high-risk, high-need person, treatment courts work to help them stop using drugs. Treatment works, recovery works, but it doesn't happen right away, and it doesn't happen in the same way for everybody. So what, what we need to do is we need to be able to understand, and, and we want to make sure that people, as you said, stay alive long enough so we can get them to that goal. We want them to stay alive enough so that they can engage in treatment and we need to pay attention to what their goals are and not always thinking about what our goals might be. Let me give you just, if you don't mind, two examples Please, yeah. of what I think I saw a couple of courts do that I thought were really consistent with this idea. One court had a participant who was, entered drug court, was using THC three times a day for a couple of weeks, trying to get used to the drug court pro program, and then, then began to use twice a day, then began to use once a day, and then, then a couple of days without using on his journey toward abstinence. So that court actually applauded that person for progressing and for him understanding that it's, it's progress, not perfection, mm -hmm. instead of sanctioning that ongoing use with jail time while this person was trying to struggle um, and, and stay as sober as possible. The second quick example is 
Um, and, and I saw this through a treatment provider. A treatment provider was working with an individual who had started treatment court and was having a tough time, not using, as we know, they have a hard time in the beginning, and that person was assessed at a residential level of care. And the participant said, I can't, I cannot go to residential care. I've got my kids at home. I'm worried about what will happen to my apartment if I, if I go to residential care. All legitimate worries, but they were assessed for residential care. I, I saw that treatment provider work with that participant to say, all right, let's try something different for a few weeks. Let's say you have an additional individual counseling session. Let's make sure you're, you're at level one IOP where you're going to group three times a week. Maybe we can have some additional case management meetings with your case manager, and we can try it that way for a few weeks. Can you agree with me that if that's still not working, you will consider residential? And the participant said yes. So, I mean, to me, that was another harm reduction approach. Instead of, here's our rule, yeah. you don't follow it, you're in trouble. And I, I, I didn't say this, but I'm also a, I'm a treatment professional. Yes. And when what you described there is actually what the American Society of Addiction Medicine recommends for an individual where, where you believe there's a certain level, as a, the clinicians out there, that you believe this is the level that they need, but that's not the level for whatever reason that they are willing to do right now. That, that ASAM indicates that if it is safe to do so, and that's critical, right. if you conclude it is safe to do so, then the approach is to, well, try them at the lower level. Guess what? It might work. <laughs> they might just do fine. Or if it doesn't work, it might help them to see, you know what, you're right, right. I need to do more. And then they're invested in that next step. Absolutely. Yeah. Th that's how you get engagement and investment. Tomorrow, and I'm not plugging my own session, because there's a lot of <laughs> sessions tomorrow, but tomorrow I'm doing a session on the seven secrets to recovery, getting well and staying that way. And, and, and we'll talk about the importance of engagement, even and maybe especially, especially in a court-involved program, engagement and investment. But I actually think that of the two examples you gave, like that's the easier one for this group to swallow, yeah. actually. Because <laughs> that first one, where it is obvious based on this real example you have, Judge, that this person, I don't know how long it took, but for some period of time, this person was actively using while in drug court. Right. Now, they were, they, their goal was abstinence. Right. And they were going to treatment. They were doing the things they were supposed right. to do. They were telling the truth about what was happening. Right. That's how you knew. Right. Uh, uh, but they were still using. And I began this session, you know, and looking at the camera back there saying that it, drug court has to be absent space because there's a connection for these folks between their drug use and crime. I'm, and we're not talking about some possession charge. Right. We're talking about crimes beyond simple yeah. possession. So how do we mitigate that? Because we, you know, part of the harm reduction approach for, for, that we accept is also reducing harm to the community. Right, right. So, so how, do you, how, do we, how do you resolve the risk to community, potentially, while a person is, we're giving them space to get better? Right, you understand right. What yes, I do. And you know, what we talk about when we come to these trainings is we really need to be targeting the high-risk person. So that means somebody who's probably committing burglary, theft, robbery, credit card fraud, all of those kinds of felonies, and we have an obligation also to make sure we are protecting the community. And I think some of the things we can do, we get kind of scared about it, we get a little panicky about what, what do we, what do, we gotta lock them up if they're, if they're doing things that are contrary to treatment court practices. But there are a lot of things we can do to make sure, for example, I know there's some courts that will say, all right, you know, you are still using, you're using less often, and that's progress, but for the next month, I want you to actually show up in, in court in front of me, the judge, a couple of times a week. Or, or I want you to see your case manager every day this week, and, or I want you to call up after you've, right before you've used, right after you've used, and come in and see me again. They also have these workbooks that the participants can, can take home and actually work through why is it that I'm struggling today. So, you know, and we also want to make sure that they are making their probation officer appointment. So if they're doing all of those things that we've told them, what I can say to the community is, this person is more highly supervised than anyone unless they're in jail. And they see somebody in drug court every single day. And so that is a, that is a really strong message yeah. that I think we're sending. So, so among the reasons why community supervision is always a part of drug court is because of that. Yeah. We, need to, we need the space to give people time to get better and community supervision helps to mitigate, we can't eliminate, but to mitigate the possible risks. How do you weigh in on this, Angela? 
So I'm, I'm just sitting over here smiling at you two. Uh, because what I'm hearing both of you describe are opportunities for treatment courts to give their participants space to be honest. Space to be so, honest. So most people who are in the midst of, of problematic substance use don't really even understand the root causes of why they're using. Yeah. You know, are they, are they trying to numb childhood trauma? Are they trying to self-medicate PTSD, mm. uh, depression, grief? So these are the underlying causes for why people are using drugs. And unless you have a space to be honest about your drug use without the threat of severe punishment, then you're never gonna have the opportunity to really dig in there and, and figure out why am I trying to numb? Yeah. You know, for, for my own recovery, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My own walk through recovery began when I had those spaces yeah. to really sit down and ask myself, talk to a clinician about, Angie, what, what pain are you trying to numb in your life? And so once I could be honest about that, then I could find some, some other solution. Yeah. And, and treatment courts ha are just the, an exquisite opportunity to give people that, that space to be honest and learn why they're using drugs in the first place. Yeah. But you know, people are functional. I mean, people, even when impaired by, by substance use disorder, they make decisions that sometimes make sense. Like, it's not unreasonable that a person is struggling to tell the truth about what's actually happening. If telling that truth is likely to result in a harsh penalty, right. I mean, that's, that's right. not unreasonable. Right. So part of what we recommend is that treatment courts, while making it clear that the goal here is for you to do everything you can to avoid use, we're here to help you do that. I'd never give a message by the way, this is a commercial. I'd never say to a client, ever, we know because this is hard, you're gonna use sometimes. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say no, that. No, I'm for real, don't say that. <laughs> because guess what? Sometimes that's not true. Some people, by the time they come to us, they are truly sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, th their journey to wellness didn't begin with us. My guess is, what I read about you is exactly true. I don't think your journey to wellness began with us. I think your journey began through a number of experiences along the way. So sometimes people do come in ready. Mm -hmm. And some people, and they say, when, when was your, we don't say clean date anymore, what we say instead. When, when was your, you recovery know. Recovery date. Yeah, when was your recovery date? When was your recovery date? Some say the day I walked in a drug court, I never used again. But that's not usually the case. Right. And so, you know, it's in our interest to create programs, and I want us to get practical here, to create programs that incentivize people telling the truth. Right. So how do we do that? Right. And I want, y'all listening, this is important. Yeah. It is in our interest. By the way, we'll talk about drug testing in a minute, but you can't, don't rely on drug testing. If drug testing is your, the primary way you know how a person is doing, that is a problem. It's a problem, it should not be the best information you have. You need it, but it shouldn't be that. We need people to tell us the truth. We need it for our information, and they need it to get better. They need to be able to take the risk mm -hmm. to tell the truth. Right. So how do we do that? Well, I mean, first of all, you know, when you think about it, someone comes into treatment court and we're, we're saying to them, hi, we're from the government. Trust, <laughs> trust us, and we'll do everything right for you. I mean, that hasn't been what's happened for them. When they are honest, they lose their kids. When they're honest, they violate probation. When they're, so honesty is a hard thing for them, and we need to be constantly con congratulating and promoting honesty. And I, somehow I find examples the best way to, to describe this. I'll give you one example of, of a case that actually happened of a participant who was had a period of sobriety, some stability, but then had a, a flare-up and, and actually assessed at residential treatment. So he went to residential treatment, was fully committed, and of course while he was there, some friends kind of uh, squatted in his apartment and they used all his stuff and he came back out of residential to clean up his apartment and guess what he found, lo and behold, some drugs, which he used. And he tested positive the next day but he did not tell his case manager, he didn't tell his probation officer, he denied to both of them that he had been using, 
And when it was time for him to, to come for his drug court session, the team discussion was around, well, you know, this was dishonest use. He's in a later phase. He just got a re out of residential. We need to give him a sanction, maybe even jail. And I said, give me just w one, one more chance to talk with him in the courtroom. And in the courtroom, I said to him, you know, before we talk about this drug test, you know, you finished residential, you completed it, and just so you know, when people come out of residential, that is one of the riskiest times for people to use again, if there isn't a warm handoff into treatment. And, and also on top of that, people feel embarrassed because they're letting down the team. So I really want to give you a chance to talk about that with me. And he put his head in his hands, and he started crying, and he admitted that he had used, and then, you know, treatment that could talk to him about how did, how did you feel about that? What was your thought process? And so, as you said, it gave him the space and the opportunity, and so we did, there was not a sanction. And, and there was some debate on the team about, well, he wasn't honest with his probation officer or his case manager, so we should still sanction it. And I said, if we do that, he will never be honest with any of us again. And, mm. and he's, he's doing much better and yeah. had an opportunity to sort of dig down as you're talking about, Angela. Yeah. yeah. People have to, to, to be, um, it, it's smart to give them another opportunity to tell the truth. That's, that's, a, that, that's smart. And that especially works if the, if the policies and the practices of your program Support that. Now, there's a, you make a determination right. of when you fear a person is now, that it's becoming a crutch. A pattern. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, you know, oh, I hope I can say this without, well, uh, oh, no. well, you know, I'm, I'm happily married for 22 years. My wife and I have a great relationship. We, we love each other to death. <laughs> and, and we've always talked about honesty, and she says, always be honest. But I'm super clear that she doesn't mean <laughs> that just because you're honest, that's a get out of trouble free card. You know, there might still be, I'm real clear on that. Right. So you gotta be careful about right. that. But, 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 but it is important that, that people know they can tell the truth and, and that's better. Angela, what do you, any perspectives on that? What do you, you know? Yeah, I think that for participants, especially in the early stages mm -hmm. of treatment court, you know, we just have to recognize that, that it's, sometimes they don't have the recovery capital necessary to maintain this hard line of abstinence. So for participants who are just coming out of jail, just coming into the program, just coming home from residential treatment, you know, we probably want to expect that there's going to be some recurrence of use there. And, and recognizing that and giving them an opportunity to be honest, just as both of you are talking about, I, I think that is a really, really important way that all treatment courts, veterans, adults, juveniles, it, family intervention courts, you can reduce harm immediately by looking at some of those policies. And I, and I think if I could say, Terrence, you know, also to make sure you have supports in place for those transition times, yeah. be, because you don't want to just wait for it to happen. You want to make sure that, that you're supporting them yeah. during that transition. Yeah. So we have 16 minutes left and we're on question three. Oh, uh, yeah. So I got <laughs> I got to do better managing, <laughs> managing this session. Uh, so, you know, earlier I asked you first about this. I'm gonna ask you first about this again. Okay. We talked about, you know, whether abstinence has a role in harm reduction. You know, as a person who has come through a treatment court, what, 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 about, the, what about the reverse of that? Uh, does using safely have a role in abstinence-based programs? So talk about that some. You know, so, so my, I cannot speak to safer use. Mm -hmm. um, my personal recovery was abstinence only. And, and I, I did 12-step recovery, went to treatment, and, and um, was not on any form of MAT. So um, what I will say about safer use and what that looks like in treatment courts is that the reality is, in the era of fentanyl, we have to talk about safer use mm. with everyone. You know, I be, my, as I said, I was in drug court and abstinence only, re, and abstinence only recovery when I began to learn about harm reduction. And I did that um, because I had the opportunity to implement the state of Mississippi's Narcan distribution program. 
And so as I'm learning about naloxone, I'm traveling around our state, training thousands of first responders on how to use it. I keep hearing this term harm reduction. I'm like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I have to go find out and learn about it. And, and I learned about it because I, I was just tired of going to funerals for my friends. Yeah. And, and I wanted to know, like, how do we, how do we save lives? And, um, and so safer use has to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we're going to continue to go to funerals. Mm -hmm. um, and so safer use, again, in the early stages of, of a participant beginning treatment court, you know, make sure they have naloxone. Make sure they know where their harm reduction sites are in your communities. Uh, another great option would be wherever you are in the country, reach out to your harm reduction coalitions in your city. Find out who they are. Find out if there's an exchange program. Go and talk to their outreach workers and ask them to come speak to your drug court staff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let them teach you about the harm reduction opportunities in your community. Good. Judge. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I, practically speaking, I think about things like, for example, I, I hear a lot about people in the early stages showing up to group or treatment high, and so they get kicked out of group or treatment. And I wonder if there is a more harm reduction type approach to that. Maybe the, the, one of the providers can take the person out into another room, stabilize them, let them return back to group when they aren't high anymore, or let's say, we need to get you safely home. I want you back here tomorrow at 8 o'clock so we can talk about what's going on. But it, I, I, it, it's troubling to me that if you are in a group session or even at a residential setting and some, some places, not all, that people are discharged for actually showing symptoms of their disease. And yeah. I think there's a way to do something about that too. Yeah. I'd also like to say to that, um, we cannot forget the other participants who have worked really hard to get right. to abstinence-based recovery. And so if another participant's use it can be triggering mm -hmm. or harmful to them, we want to mitigate that as much as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So exactly what you said, if a participant comes in and it's obvious that they've been using, we want to, you know, re to bring them in a separate group or maybe even have separate groups for those who are practicing harm reduction and those who are already in abstinence-based recovery. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky walk to Indeed protect both, both populations. Well, among the evidence based approaches, or what are the, I would say even the principles of evidence-based addiction treatment is that treatment be client-centered. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that's also true when it's a court-involved program. Right. It needs to be client-centered, even though it's court-involved and we have certain requirements. So let's talk about, and Judge, if you could start, talk about what it actually means to be client-centered, you know, especially within an option like treatment courts, where they're, 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 they're judges and POs involved. Right, yeah, I mean, and that, that is a difficult challenge as well. And I think to be client-centered means that we all need to know what the treatment plan is, everybody on the team. Maybe we, need an in, we, we do need an integrated treatment plan and an integrated case management plan. And the probation officer and treatment provider need to know what those goals are, when those goals are designed to be achieved, and they need to be working together, the probation officer, the treatment provider, the case manager, and have regular contact almost daily about how the participant is doing and what that participant's goals are. And you know, one thing I would say about treatment courts is that they recognize, and we recognize, that there are all different kinds of motivation. I mean, people can start tr treatment court being motivated simply to stay out of jail, get off of probation earlier, get their children back, um, get their, their charges expunged. And that is a perfectly valid, legitimate motivation, and that's where they are at at the moment. So we say to them, great, I'm glad you're in treatment court, how can I help you stay out of prison? Yeah. You know, I, and, and so I, I think we need to, in that way, recognize that they're gonna go at a pace that we wish maybe would be different, they're gonna have a goal that we think might be, should be different, yeah. and, and we need to be more patient than the substance use disorder. Yeah. Again, to my treatment folks out there, my providers, you know, our need to be client-centered and to be collaborative in doing treatment planning doesn't go away because we are part of a treatment court team. It doesn't. We gotta figure out how we do it. You know, a, a person has to decide that they want absence to be their goal. They have to decide to walk, to, walk toward that. 
And our role, if we work with the drug court team, is to help them accept their realities. That you know, whatever they want to do forever, whatever they want to do right now, they're in a program that's going to require them to become abstinent to complete it. Or in another context, in order to keep your professional license, you got to stop using. Or in order to stay uh, on the sports team. So part of how we how we counsel you know, in walking along a person is helping them to accept their realities. It looks like your wife is done, man. If you don't stop right. drinking, it's over. I have someone close to me who called me, and that's where she is. She said, if he doesn't stop, it's over. And so as, as, even though we're part of a drug court team, we're not another arm of the court. We're helping professionals, and we're helping them to accept their realities, help them make the right decisions to keep the commitments they've made, but we can't force it on them. What, what, you, what do you think about this? Client-centered. Yeah. So what's popping into my mind is, is, again, the topic of MAT, as Carolyn was talking about earlier. Mm. You know, remembering that MAT, it, at its very core, must be client-centered. So you guys, everybody in this room, have over the past several years have really turned the corner on bringing in the, the use of MAT into your treatment courts. And I applaud you all for doing that. You know, and it's, it's, it's really important to remember that while, you're all, while you are doing MAT, it looks different for everyone. So Terrence might need to be on a buprenorphine program for six months and then he's, he's stable enough in his recovery to titrate. Tina may need to be on MAT for seven or eight years before she is, is clinically ready and her prescribers agree that she's at a, at a point to try to titrate. So just remembering that is that MAT looks different for everyone will reduce harm in your treatment courts. And I think to, to follow up on that as a great point is that in our courts, whether someone's using MAT, whether they should be using MAT, if they're on MET, that should, that should never be a criteria for whether they can enter or not, whether they can progress or not, or whether they graduate. So we as, as judges and lawyers and probation officers should not be saying, this person can't be in my treatment court because they're on medication-assisted treatment. We can't be saying, this person can't graduate because they're on medication-assisted treatment. That is a treatment decision, and I think that's a really important message, too, yes. about harm reduction. I think that's right. So let's talk a little bit about responding to use. Carolyn Harden talked about that some. She referenced proximal distal behaviors. And so, Judge, I'd like you to talk a little. We're, we don't, I think only you can weigh in on this. We've okay. got to move more quickly. But, but, but talk, we do know that there are still some treatment programs that treatment courts that reserve their more stringent sanctions for substance use, mm -hmm. uh, even early in the program. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen a lot anymore, but it still happens. Yeah. The treatment court, a treatment court I was associated with, that was our business for a long time right. before we learned better. Right. Talk about why, why that can be so harmful right. and why it should be avoided. Okay, yeah. No, I think there are some courts, not many, hopefully, that will say, you know, your third, fourth use, that's going to be a jail sanction early in the, in the phases. And we know from both addiction science, as Carolyn was talking about, and behavior science, that, that if we punish somebody for something that they can't avoid, then we're going to make them worse. And, and we're actually going to engage in sort of learned helplessness. And so we need to make sure, if, if we're imposing sanctions, jail sanctions, for somebody who's using early on in the program, then we are causing harm. And that's, that's even more particularly important to keep in mind when you're talking about someone who has stabilized in treatment and then has a recurrence of use. We need to look at why was there recurrence of use? What, what happened to cause it? Did somebody just reveal a trauma in treatment? Are they, did their partner just file for divorce? Uh, what's going on in their lives that has resulted in this use? And how did they personally respond to it? So we, we need to get away from the formula that says they had a period of stability, now they're in phase three, they used again, they go to jail. We need to look at what happened with that person and make sure that we aren't causing more harm um, and we, we need to sort of think about what can we do to support them, 
let's pay attention to the circumstances around this resumption of use. So I, I like the way you put that because I think we've done a pretty good job. And unfortunately, I can't yeah. allow time for pause. We got to keep moving. <laughs> um, I think we've done. I think we've I done a pretty. <laughs> I think we've done a pretty good job in in the treatment court field of understanding what yeah. Carolyn mentioned, proximal distal behaviors. So broadly, there's an understanding that early in yeah. in, the, in the couple first couple of phases that 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 we consider, you know consistent absence to be a distal goal for most, and so we're not using stringent sanctions in response to that. We are adjusting treatment, mm -hmm. uh, doing lower level sanctions, trying to work with them. But, but I think the last part you said is really important too that I don't want you to miss, because somehow how we, some people have gotten the impression, oh, well, that means if they're in the last phase and they use, that's willful, time to bring down the hammer. Right. And actually, that's super not true, because as a person, who has worked, and I said this from the stage last year, that as a person who has worked with people in with addiction for 30 years, you know, a person who is, who is in recovery, they are experiencing it. They are proud of themselves. Yeah. You're proud of them. Mm -hmm. They can't imagine ever going back to the old right. way. Right. And then they pick up again. Right. That is crushing. The last thing we need to do is pile on. Yeah. The last thing. Right. That's how people give up. Right. Right. Yeah, they're piling on to themselves at that yeah, point. And we, don't we want that. they we, need the opposite. We gotta keep yeah. them from giving up. I'll talk tomorrow about the importance of resistance in the moment and persistence in the long haul. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. Richard Schwartz, oh, who's the minutes. developer of the internal family systems therapy model, uh, yeah. also known as IFS. I was listening to him the other day and he said, for all of his clients, he never views a relapse as a negative thing. He looks as a, at a relapse as an opportunity. If substance use is coming back in this person's life, there is something there that we ha yet, have yet to uncover. And so it's an opportunity to dig in and help this person heal. And, and that, I think, yeah. just echoes what both of you were just and, saying. And the last message we want to send to them is, what happened? You've done so well. How could you let this happen? We don't mm -hmm. want to send that message. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I put my notes down because yeah. it's two minutes. <laughs> 30 seconds. What's the last thing you want these folks to know? 30 seconds. This is your last time to talk with them at all in this setting. 30 seconds. What you want them to hear? Okay. So if you guys hear nothing else today, I hope you hear this. When you go back home from this conference and you're all energized, you've learned all this new material, I hope and I would challenge all of you to go back to your state, bring your treatment court team together and do an internal evaluation and ask yourselves, what are the things, what are some of the things that we're doing? What policies do we have that are causing harm to our participants? Mm. Or that might be. Take a, that yeah. might be. Yeah. Yeah. Take a look in the mirror and see if you can come up with some solutions on your own mm. that will help your clients get better. And, uh, and I think that's a wonderful place to start yeah. this conversation. Yes, yes, Judge. I would just say that when you give somebody a choice about their well-being, they are more invested in their well-being, especially in a system that's always taken away choice. Yeah. I'll say, tell your whole story, folks. Yeah. You know, part of the harm reduction approach is noticing progress along the way. It, it is a good thing to pay attention to people who get to the end to see the outcomes from folks who finish and, they are, and they're free of substances, hallelujah. It's also important to look at the progress along the way, people who stayed alive, people who, whose housing got solidified, people who got better, whose quality of life improved, even if they don't quite reach the finish line. We should be monitoring those in, that interim progress and reporting that. That's part of the story. That's part of the story of drug courts. We help people get better. I hope they end up achieving their goal of full abstinence. But regardless, if we can help their, them, them improve their lives and document that, that's a story worth telling. Thank you so much for being here. Thank the panel for me.